there. We want to go to Luke chapter 23. And we are presently in a mini-series, maybe not so many, but we are talking about the last words of Jesus. And that is that there were seven times that Jesus spoke while he hung up on the cross. Within that time frame of about the six hours that he, he spoke here that uh, we will see during that time. And we just began last week, and so we're talking about the second one here today. Stand, if you would, please. And uh, we'll be looking to the word of the Lord. Luke chapter 23. And let's begin our reading there at verse 39. And we're going to read down to and through verse 43. As we said that uh, different ones of the Gospels will refer to uh, different ones. And Luke has three, John has three, and Matthew has one. And then as you put all of that together, you can see the chronology of uh, how they came and when he spoke. So this is the second one. Luke chapter 23, beginning our reading at verse 39. And one of the male factors which were hanged railed on him saying, if you be Christ, and Christ means the anointed one, save yourself and us. But the other, the other male factor, you know, he was hanging between two of them. Answering, rebuked him, the other saying, Do you not fear God, seeing you are in the same condemnation? And, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. And he said, that, that same male factor, he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Today uh, shall you be with me in paradise. Somebody say amen. amen. You may be seated. <coughs> So today we're talking about that second last saying of Jesus as he hung up on the cross and the second word that penetrated the darkness. And when I say darkness, we know there was literal darkness from noon till uh, three, but uh, I'm talking about just the darkness of what took place on Golgotha as Jesus was crucified. And we see that last week, the first word was a prayer where he prayed, Father, forgive them for they don't know Know what they are doing. And now as it relates to Christ and as it relates to this male factor, here we have not a prayer, it is a prayer, but as far as the Lord is concerned, he answers a prayer. And so the first one, the reason I called it a prayer, because it was, but this is a promise. Here is a promise that the Lord makes to this guy as he's hanging upon the cross with Jesus. So it naturally divides itself into two sections. First of all, you have the plea of the male factor. Then you have the promise of the master. And so we're going to kind of look in the introduction a little bit about the male factor and what he is asking. But our, our message this morning is predominantly going to focus upon the promise that Jesus gave unto him. And you talk about this male factor. Now that's what Luke refers to them as. But if you go back to Matthew, 
he, he refers to them as thieves. But these two were not thieves in the sense that you and I, in the traditional sense that we may think of, that they are individuals that they go out and their main purpose is to take that which does not belong unto them. That, that's not what, what these male factors are. In fact, as is referred to here in Luke, they would be better described in our time and our word our vernacular, they were insurrectionists. They were revolutionists against the Roman Empire. They would have been a part of the Jewish underground of that day. And, and, and they would, uh, their hands would have been deeply stained with the blood of uh, anybody that they felt in authority or other otherwise associated with the tyranny of the Roman Empire that they would go and under the cover of darkness they would take them out little by little one at a time and so thieves in that sense would kind of be like icing on the cake that if they went and took somebody out if they found something that would benefit their cause they would certainly steal it and take it away. But as I've already said, make no doubt about it, these guys, they didn't slip out into the darkness of night and commit their dastardly and dangerous deeds for the sake of taking what did not belong them, except the taking of lives that they deem necessary because of their cause. Now we see that our guy that the Lord focuses upon we see that he prays and he calls out unto the Lord. But it's not necessarily out of fear of what's going on and where he finds himself. Now the other male factor, that is the only reason he cried out to the Lord. He said, if you be the Christ, if you truly are the anointed one, if you are God, if you are who some say that that you are, notice, save yourself, but most of all, save my hide. Get me off of this cross. Get me out of here. I know that I'm going to die in a very short time. So, so get me out. Isn't it amazing that when the individuals, they begin to come into close proximity with death and they know that death is imminent and so on and so forth, why they will cry out to the Lord. Now this guy, uh, the guy that said, uh, if you be Christ, save yourself and save us. He was not concerned about what he was, but he was only concerned about where he was. There's a vast difference. You see, most individuals, when they call out upon God, they're concerned about where they are, what's going on in their lives. Lord, I need help. I need you. I need you to come in. And then when the Lord does it, they, they forget about it. Uh, but you see, our guy, although I'm sure he was concerned about where he was, he's hanging on a cross and he's going to die. But he was more concerned about what he was. Not where he was, but what he was. And he cried out unto the Lord and said, When you come into your kingdom, would you remember me? You see, this guy, he professed and he openly spoke all of the ingredients that is necessary for an individual to be saved uh, by the blood of Jesus Christ and to have their sins forgiven. You see, first of all, he feared God. He asked the other one, don't you fear God? I do. And then he realized that he was a sinner. He said, you know, we're 
we're getting our just desserts here. This guy, he's not done anything referring to Christ. He also had faith in God. He also realized he was in a situation that he could do nothing about himself. And he needed the help of God. And he believed in Jesus Christ and he called out unto the Lord. So let me tell you, those are all of the ingredients that he needed the first one after or during the cross and then you and I that have come many years later uh, that that's how you come to the Lord and have a personal relationship with Christ and so I believe that in that moment's time that the Lord saved him but now we're, we're focused, as we said, is not so much upon this male factor, his plea, but on the promise of the master. When, when he said, remember me when you come into your kingdom, Jesus said, verily I say unto you, today you shall be with me in paradise. That statement is only 14 words long. And if you say it with meaning, which I'm sure Jesus did, it would take less than 10 seconds to say it. But yet that short phrase effectuated a, an eternity of peace to a very troubled man. Today you shall be with me in paradise. So in this little response of the Lord, I want to look at the four major words. I want to look at verily, I say unto you, today is the next word, and then you shall be with me, the third uh, uh, two words I want to look at, and then paradise is going to be the fourth word. So the first one here, verily, what an assurance. Yes. Praise God. So what do you mean, Pastor? What an assurance. What a faith builder. What a confidence builder that Jesus has said. As you read through the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and they tell the story of Jesus and his actions in many places, his words. And if you have a red uh, letter edition, all the words of Christ are in red and so on and so forth. Have you ever noticed the amount of times that Jesus prefaces what he is about to say with verily or Verily, verily. Sometimes he repeats it to accentuate what he's about to say. Why, why, why would the Lord say that? In fact, you can find that in Matthew, right around 30 times, he uses verily. In the Gospel of John, verily, verily, right around 25 times. So when he speaks to people and he's about to declare or say something, then why does does he use this word verily? What does it mean? It's interesting because the word verily is closely associated with the word amen. We close our prayers off in the name of Jesus. Amen. What does amen mean? Or if I'm preaching and you're kind of quiet this morning, but if you were to say amen, what does that mean? Why, why do you say amen? It simply means so be it or it is so. I agree with what you're saying and truth is what you are speaking. So that's, that's what it refers to. So maybe we would use the word instead of verily, verily, we would say truly, truly or surely, surely what I'm about to say to you is true. It's an expression that uh, leaves no place for doubt, no place for fear. It's an expression of the utmost uh, uh, 
not only possibility, but that it will happen. Certainty, that's the word that I'm looking for. It speaks, it's an expression of, of the utmost certainty. And so what the Lord is saying to this guy, truly, truly, in the midst of the unprecedented place where both of us are, hanging on a cross, here in Golgotha, and we're about to die, but he said, I've got something to say to you. And what I'm about to say to you is true. It is true. Even though it may seem outlandish to you, it may seem like you can't comprehend it. Uh, there's no way that you could hardly believe it. It is true. Verily, verily, I say, or verily, I say unto you, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Wow. Wow. I believe that you would think this guy in the line of work that he's in would have a lot of uncertainties. I would dare say that if he kissed his wife uh, as he slipped into the darkness of night, I wonder how many times he may have thought this is the last time I'll see my wife, I'll see my children. I wonder if there were times that because of work, are they going to catch me? Is this going to be the time that I'm not able to do what I do? Is this going to be the moment? So, so is life is filled with question marks and uncertainties everywhere that you look. But yet when Jesus spoke to him that the very promise that he's about to make, it doesn't start out with, hopefully I can help you. I'll do the best that I can or possibly I can make something work here for you. No, that's not how the Lord said it. But he said, truly, surely, without any doubt at all, what I am saying to you is true. You see, the only thing that this guy had certain going on is he was certain to die. But now the Lord gives him complete assurance that even though his life was a wreck, even though he was about to die, things are going to change drastically for you. And it is true. It is true. It is true. True, praise God. So verily, what an assurance. Aren't you glad that everything that Jesus says to us is true? Aren't you glad that the promises of the Lord, the Bible says, are yes and amen? What does that mean? They are yes. God says yes, I will do them. We say amen. I believe it, so be it. It is true. They are true. And so whatever your life may look like and how ugly your life may look like when Jesus gives a promise and says that I'm able to change you completely it's true it's true he's able to take all of the broken pieces and he's able to put them together and to make us a new and a fresh something beautiful. So verily, verily I say unto you, so verily I say, verily what assurance. It's true. But he said, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Today what action? Let me say it again. Today what action? I'm sure that this guy, as it relates to Christ, this male factor, I'm sure he'd heard of Jesus. That's why he cries out unto him. I don't know how much he knew about the Lord. 
But as he cries out to him, I'm sure that he did not know all of the details and the intricacies such as you and I do not know of how Jesus relates to time and eternity. But yet Jesus is the master who holds the key to both time and eternity. And did you notice how, how this guy says it? He said, when you come into your kingdom, when. He didn't give him any specific time. I, I, I want you to do it now. You see, that's the implications of, of the other guy. Save yourself and save us now. Now. The sooner the better. But this guy, he just said, remember me when. Whenever. Whenever you get time. Whenever you think of me, whenever uh, you get around to it, it doesn't matter when, but just sometime would you remember me when you come into your kingdom. Have you ever had a situation in your life or something that you needed somebody else to work on or somebody else to do for you? It was very important to you, but you couldn't do it yourself. And so you had to call somebody else that was their expertise in that to take care of the situation. You needed it done yesterday. And as you call around, everybody says, sure, I can help you, but I'm a week out. I'm two weeks out. I'm a month out. Why, it'll be uh, a month and a half before I can get to you. Ever been there, done that? Why, even sometimes if you're going to see a specialist at the doctor, you know, well, it's going to be a month before you can get there. And so... How amazing is it when you make all these calls and everybody said, yeah, I can get to it, but it's way out there. And somebody says, yeah, I can take care of that. And you say, okay, when? Today. What? What action today? You get to me today? Are you folks awake this morning? Okay. Just wanted to make sure. Today, what action? Praise God. You know, folks, we, we live in a day of wait. Yes. Uh, how many examples can I give here? There's a situation that rises for whatever, whoever you need to make a phone call. You call, and it takes you half an hour to navigate the robots. If you want this, press 1. If you want this, press 2. If you want this, press 50. If you want this, press 100. If you want this, and they go down the line, and you don't know what you want. You don't know which one of those apply. And so uh, if you do not know your extension, please hang on the line and our next representative will get to you as soon as possible. And then the music kicks in. And then every so often they'll come in and say, your call is important to us. So the next uh, uh, available representative will get to you. The music kicks in. And then a half an hour, 45 minutes later, and I'm no exaggeration here, you finally get a hold of somebody and you ask the question and they answer it in five words. So I waited all that time to hear about that. Have you been to the doctor recently? I was not too long ago. It's been a few months, but he wanted me to come in just for, uh, take a look at me again. And you know, you go in there and here's all these other people that tell you, okay, here's your appointment. You get there 15 minutes early, thinking that possibly... But you know what? They don't get to you. And so they have this whole wall of outdated magazines. Now, the outdated magazines are there to make your wait more enjoyable. 
news that has been long past. So you wait and you wait. Have you been to the the DMV lately? I have. Just about a month ago. I told Cynthia, I said, I'm going to get there when the door opens. I got there when the door opens and there was a line already outside. When they opened the door, we went in and we waited and we waited and we waited. Finally, we got to the receptionist after I'd waited a half an hour in line. She says, uh, uh, yes, sir. Why are you here? This is why I'm here. Okay, here's your number. Go have a seat and wait till your number's called. What? There's 50 people sitting there in front of me. So I know they're, they're in front of me. So what do I do? Wait, 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 wait. We wait in lines. It's fast food, but if it, you hit it a certain time, you're going to wait in line. We wait at lights. I've lived here for two years. I've gone to work for two years. And the light out here on Route 4 and 161, I can count on my hands how many times I've been able to drive through that light, either going or coming. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I get caught at that light every time. And I wait. And there's no cars going 161 and we have these big lines on Route 4. Okay, I'm venting this morning, okay? You get the idea. Wait. We wait. We wait. We wait. So how, how blessed is that? When the Lord, we go to the Lord and we say, Lord, I need something. And the Lord says, right now, today. Now, I know that doesn't always happen because it's not his will or it's not his best for us. But when it comes to salvation, when it comes to somebody crying out to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you. I'm on my way to hell. I need you to save me. The Lord doesn't say, I'll get to you next week or tomorrow or next year. But he says, now, today. Today, 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 what action of Almighty God. Somebody say amen. amen. Today, what action? Verily, what assurance. What a faith builder. Today, what action? But he says something peculiar. Because this guy is saying, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today, you're going to be with me. What association? With me. All he says is when you get around to it, remember me. He didn't ask anything specific. He wasn't like James and John, the disciples of Christ, and their mother coming to the Lord before the crucifixion and said, Jesus, I'd uh, like to have a word with you if I could. Sure. Well, when you come into your kingdom, I would like for my two sons, one to sit on your right hand and one on the left. I, I would like for one to be the, you'll be the president, but I'd like for one of them to be the first vice president and the other one to be the second vice president. He didn't ask for that. He didn't ask to be, have a cabinet position of any kind. He didn't ask for any type of authority, any type of position. He just says, when you get around to it, would you think of me? 
us meeting here and on the cross and as time has put us together in this moment in divine intersections. No doubt he's thinking, Lord, I've come in at the very, very last moment that you can possibly come in. I'm a Johnny come lately. I'm, I know that I'm a nobody. I'm not asking for position. In fact, if you would remember me in some way, I, 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 I will do the task in your kingdom that nobody else will do. I'll, I'll wash your feet. I'll wash the feet of your visitors that come to you. Or maybe I'll wash the dishes or I'll clean the floors. I'll, uh, what, what anybody else associated with a kingdom maybe would not want to do, I'm willing to do it if you just remember me. And I can imagine the Lord saying, Son, not only will I remember you, but today you're going to be with me. Where I am, that's where you're going to be. Lord, I'm willing to be afar off and only see you in a distance of what you're doing. But today you're going to be with me. What an association. You see, church, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, we've talked about it before. It is about positions. It is about places. It is about performances. We are going to be the servants of God even in the eternal state. But listen to me. The bottom line of, of a relationship with Christ and the kingdom of God, and when we go to heaven, it's not about places. It's not about performance. It's not about position, but it's about a person. Not a cabinet position, but with Christ. So why are we so excited about being in the presence of the Lord and seeing Him? And even though He had the paradise was was Abraham's bosom at the time. And when he died, he went to paradise. And for the time, he was in the grave. But then when he resurrected, he led those that were saved uh, before the cross. He led them into heaven, as the Bible declares. And now paradise is in the presence of God. So today, you're going to be with me in paradise. And he was. And then a couple days later, he was in the presence of God. This guy knew about association. No doubt he got in the underground by being associated, knowing just anybody couldn't do it. It had to be hush-hush. It had to be people that was trusted. So, so he knew what associations were and be associated with individuals that, that he could trust and so on and so forth. But what an association to be with Jesus. I'm going to close with this. Verily, what assurance today, what action with me, what an association in paradise, what an abode, what an abode, what a place to be, to dwell, to live in paradise. We know that one of these days the Lord's going to make everything new and in the eternal state and no more sin, no more crying, no more pain, no more suffering. All of that's going to be passed and in the presence of the Lord and for an individual such as he was yet to receive such a promise from the Lord. So if you're thinking you're too bad or you're thinking, Pastor, you don't know my past life. You don't know where I've been, what I've done. 
Take a look at this guy. And the Lord says today, you're going to be with me in paradise. <clears throat> Jonathan Edwards, maybe the name doesn't ring a bell, but if you study the history of this nation, he was an individual that, that preached in a congregationalist church in the up in New England at the time. And they say that he was so monotone, he was so dry when he would preach. Boring. But yet the Spirit of the Lord would come down as he preached the Word of God. And one of his most famous messages it's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I have the message, and as you read it, he likens a sinner to a spider that's hanging onto its web over a flame. And at any moment, that, that slight web can let loose or be frayed or burned or the heat give way and the spider falls into the flame. He goes through and talks about the brevity of our lives and, 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 and how that our lives is dangling like that. We're dangling over the pits of hell. And he said, that's why that today is the day of salvation. Don't put it off. I thought about that message as I thought about this guy. You talk about somebody that was dangling over the pits of hell. And in a few moments, that's where he's going to go and spend eternity. But when he called out upon the Lord... He was rescued from the pit and he was relegated to paradise and he was taken there to be with Christ. You know, only Jesus can take a dirty, rotten sinner such as he was, such as I was, such as all of us were, and in a moment's time, make us fit for heaven only he can do that he's the only one so today you're going to be with me in paradise can the Lord say that about me can the Lord say that about you can the Lord call your name and say yeah you're going to be with me for eternity and throughout the endless ages, I trust that he can. Father, I thank you today for your goodness. I thank you, Lord, for your saving grace and mercy. I thank you, Lord, that whatever our history is, that our future is bright. Whatever was in the past, the future with you redeemed by the blood of the Lamb having our sins cleansed completely taken away from us what a joy and I want to thank you Lord that you were willing to go to the cross and Lord that one of the very first things actions upon the cross is that you saved this man that many would have never ever given him a second chance. He's doomed to die. And rightfully so, civilly, he needs to pay for his crimes. But spiritually, Lord, you gave him a second chance. And Lord, that's, that's the business you're in the God of the second chance, the third chance, or whatever it may be. But 
Thank you, Lord, for being so patient and long-suffering with us. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the opportunity to come in and, and to be saved. Thank you, Lord, that I know we're a ways out from Easter, but as we approach Easter with these last seven saves, Jesus on the cross, to remind us of how much you love us, how much you care about us, how much you want the best for us. So, Lord, help us to be like this one male factor. We may be in a mess, but not be so concerned where I am, but what I am. What has my life become? What have I become? I've tried to fix it on my own, but I cannot. But if we'll come to Jesus and ask Him, He can do what we cannot do. And he can do it in a moment's time. I thank you, Lord, for the hope that we have. So bless us, Lord, here today. And I'll give you the praise for I ask it in the name of Jesus.